Every Major League player dreams of playing in the World Series. Here's the pitch. A line drive to center. This could be it. May is waiting. He's got it. The go for the pennant. As history has shown us, getting to the series can turn a long season into an unforgettable battle in which Cole's statistics are buried under the weight of a team playing for a pennant. It puts the Phillies up six to four. <laughs> It is that great stretch of games, that September rush of excitement and anxiety, in which every pitch, every swing, every decision carries almost unbearable weight. Ground ball is short. This could be it. Has one, has two. The game is over. The Mets are the champion. The tension is overwhelming, but no one, not fan, not player, wants to let up. This agonizing and at once thrilling stretch of baseball, the pennant race is pure magic. Winning run right on third. Base hit. Blue Jays win the East. Let the celebration begin. This is the story of baseball's greatest pennant races. In the 1950s, New York National League baseball fans were passionately divided between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants. It was a case of pride, die-hard allegiance, and mutual hate. I think uh, the Giants and Dodgers had the greatest rivalry when they were here in New York in baseball. The reason was that their clubhouse uh, was like right there, and over here, was our clubhouse, and there was a door in between. And you could hear them talking, you could hear us talking. And we'd holler at each other in between the door. The rivalry reached its peak in 1951. The Dodgers' first place lead over the Giants grew to 13 and a half games shortly after sweeping their rivals in mid-August. I remember Dress saying, come on, we got to go sing by that door. I said, Charlie, I don't want to do that. Yeah, we got to go sing. The Giants are dead. The Giants are dead. Well, that... You know, that just rubbed me wrong, because that's not my style. You just, you beat them, nice guys, pat them on the back, say, hey, get us next time or something. But he, he, I think that riled him up also, because I thought that was a very bush maneuver to, to rub their noses in it. On August 12th, the Giants began their surge, and in one of the greatest comebacks of all time, they won 16 in a row, 39 out of 47. It was the finest bit of managing that DeRocher or any other manager uh, ever had. He kept egging us on. He never did say, uh, let's catch him. He always, always said, let's see how close we could come. While the Giants were making their historic comeback, the Dodgers, despite a huge lead, were beginning to squirm. Well, the Giants got hot. I don't know how many of them won 40 out of 45 games a lot of part of the season. And they just kept coming. And the first thing you know, you start watching the scoreboard every day and see what's the score, what's the Giants doing? Well, instead of really going out and taking the care of the game that you have there. And uh, so it comes down the last day in Philadelphia, we we're playing the Phillies and uh, the Giants are playing Boston. I'll never forget it. Uh, we ended up winning the ball game. So now we're in the locker room and everybody's celebrating the pennant, you know, as if we we won the pennant because you guys at that point were, uh, what, four or five runs behind? Right. Fifth, six innings, something like that. So we thought we'd won the pennant. Yeah, well, we had a tough game with Philly. It was a lopsided game, and then we came back, and, and I remember Jackie made a great play back at second base. Went to his right and dove and caught the ball backhand and well on his belly, threw it to second base for a double play, which ended the rally and kept the game tied. And then the next inning, he hit a home run to win it in the 14th inning. And that was, you know, probably one of the most... Uh, Had to be one of his greatest great, games. Yeah, you great know, game. To, I mean, I'll never forget Campanella saying on a train riding home, he said, oh, my goodness, we got to face Magley. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes. And I remember getting to Grand Central Station, and of course, a lot of people were waiting for us. And uh, we got to play those Dodgers. Coming back on the train, DeRocha said one thing to us. I think that helped us. He said, well, let's go out like it's the first day of the season. No, now it's a matter of, uh, of uh, two out of three. 
The first game was in Brooklyn. We won that one. And the thing that people never talk about is that Thompson hit a home run off me in the first game and gave the Giants a, a two-run lead. Tuesday, LeBine pitched in the polo grounds and beat the Giants 10-0. Having won a game apiece, the season came down to Don Newcomb against Sal Magley for the pennant. Because Newcomb went a strong game, you know, just got tied in the, uh, the ninth inning. Top of the ninth, uh, dark single, Mueller single. Uh, I did everybody a favor by fouling out, not hitting to a double play. <laughs> and then, but behind me, Lockman got a key hit down the left field line. All right, so Don Mueller sprains his ankle, sliding into third. And uh, now they take uh, Big Newt out and they bring in Ralph. And uh, Ralph was a super pitcher. I said, you know, I told him, nice going. I said, I'm going to get him for you. You know, I'll get him for you. He said, okay. Well, I have last of the night. Back of pitches. Bobby Thompson takes a strike call on the inside corner. Oops. Oh, no. Right I down the middle. Why'd I you take, take that? that one. I don't know. <laughs> the good Lord said, don't swing at that, baby. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you hit that one, I would be mad. Back of throws. The Giants win the pennant. 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 The Giants win we couldn't believe, I could not believe that this, that we do not get another bat. We have to get another chance. How did we do this, you know? How to, you know, has it finally happened? You mean to tell me we've done it, you know, after be, being so far behind? The home run didn't excite me. I was shocked. I never expected it. I went into shock. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know where I was at. And I want to shake hands with him and couldn't because Stanky had me on the ground, kissing me, saying, we did it, we did it, we, I know Eddie. And Eddie Stanky hugs Leo DeRocher in unrestrained joy. Lippy's Cinderella team writes baseball history for a magnificent stretch battle. And Bobby Thompson, whose home run wrapped it up, is the center of jubilant teammates and giant fans. 39 out of their last 47 games is some record. And then coming from behind in this one, oh, brother, what a pennant victory. Giant fans will be talking about Bobby Thompson and today's game for years to come. Nineteen sixty four was the year of the phenomenon from the Beatles to the New York World's Fair to the Philadelphia Phillies. As for the latter, the Phillies were hoping to make a World Series appearance for the first time in fourteen years. In sixty four everybody was having a good year and everybody contributed and uh, we just had a great bunch of guys and it was the closest team I've ever been associated with uh, that one year. Good team. Real good team. Uh, we did a lot more there, probably with enthusiasm, than, than we did with uh, experience, because uh, I think we only had something like six, seven veterans, you know, with any kind of experience, and the rest of us were all uh, young, uh, first-year players. The best of the first-year players was Allen himself, who would produce 29 homers, 91 RBIs, and a 318 average to run away with Rookie of the Year honors. But while Allen was putting up enviable numbers at the plate, he was struggling through his first season ever at third base, making 41 errors. There's no way that a few errors were going to hurt his year. He was just so great that year, and uh, I thought he was uh, one of the greatest ball players I ever played with. And, uh, when he was out in that field, he played hard every day, and there was no fooling around, and gave 100%. He was out there every inning, every day. As the team's veteran star, Johnny Callison would hit more than 30 homers and drive in more than 100 runs. With that kind of offense, the rebuilt Phillies felt they could finally make some headway. Then, too, Gene Mock had a potent pair in the pitching department. 
Left-hander Chris Short was becoming one of the league's best pitchers, while Jim Bunning was already established. And despite preseason predictions to the contrary, the Phillies found themselves in a pennant race. On June 21st, they were still in first place. Everything was going right, never more so than a June day at Shea Stadium when Bunning could do nothing wrong. Jim Bunning is now one strike from a perfect ball game. How do you stay cool and how do you stay poised in a spot like this? Bunning got to the seventh inning, he said, you know, look, you guys start diving. He said, I got a no hitter here. <laughs> he was wound up. And uh, so we all started laughing and we started talking about it. And, uh, I guess it relaxed him more than us. The 33-year-old right-hander from Southgate, Kentucky. Looks in for his sign. Two outs and nobody on. He's retired 26 in a row. Struck it out. A perfect game. A perfect game for Jim Murray. Here come his teammates. Oh, what a happy scene for the Phils and Jim Bunning. Sweeping the Mets that afternoon gave the Phillies a two-game lead. Though nothing, as it turns out, was here to stay. Not while Johnny Keene's Cardinals were making plenty of their own noise, most of it coming from Ken Boyer, who would win the MVP with 24 homers and 119 RBIs. As late as mid-June, the Cardinals had been languishing in eighth place. But as the trading deadline approached, they made a fateful swap with the Cubs. In exchange for established pitcher Ernie Brolio, the Cardinals got a little known but speedy outfielder by the name of Lou Brock. I got to St. Louis and uh, St. Louis had just lost to the Dodgers two years in a row as they saw it. And they, they lost simply because the Dodgers had a stolen base artist by the name of Mario Wills. I got to St. Louis and the manager called a meeting and said we were going to have a base stealer and we're going to match the Dodgers base steal for base steal. And I go, wow, we're going to do all that? What happened with Brock is that he gave us something we didn't have. We didn't have a leadoff man and we didn't have speed. He gave us all of that. And consequently, when that happens, it lifts everyone up. It gives everybody a little uh, enthusiasm. Brock was spectacular, and the Cardinals started to stir. For his new team, Lou would hit 348 and steal 33 bases. And before the Phillies knew what happened, St. Louis was closing in, along with the Reds and the Giants, who were led by Willie Mays' 47 homers. And suddenly, with 12 games left in the season, the Phillies' six-and-a-half game lead was shrinking into one of the greatest collapses in baseball history. I would like for it to be more of a a fairy tale and say that we didn't give up and all that but you know the Phillies were primarily responsible for the fact that we didn't give up. Everything went wrong. I mean uh, I just don't know what else to say because there's so many different things that we look at each other and say well how are we going to lose one this time you know. You could actually feel it in the clubhouse. Of, you know, matter of fact you could almost cut it with a knife. Uh, Jeez, we just know something was going to happen. I saw ground balls, that were double play balls, that bounced over guys' shoulders. You know, stuff didn't happen to us all year until that last streak. In that streak, the Phillies lost seven straight before going to St. Louis. The blame went to Gene Mock. Gene Mock, the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, kept pitching two pitchers down the stretch, Chris Short and Jim Bunning. And when you pitch a pitcher every two days, 200 hitters become 400 hitters. You actually allow the other team to get off the deck. The Cardinals did more than get off the deck. They won eight straight. And when they played Philadelphia with less than a week to go, they passed the Reds by sweeping the Phillies right out of first, sending their fans and team owner into ecstasy. A bouncing ball, they should do it. The Cardinals are in first place. The Redbirds win it eight to five. Gordon Richardson being congratulated. And now the pressure has been put on by the Cardinals. Down to the final three games of the season, the Cardinals were not the only ones feeling the intense pressure. There were four teams. When we started the games on Friday, with only three left to play, there could have been a four-way tie. Yeah, that's how close that pennant race was. A three-way tie was still possible on the last day of the season, but the Reds lost to the Phillies. And so for both teams, 
Their only hope was that back in St. Louis, the Cardinals would lose to the Mets. Johnny Keane about to bring the Redbirds their first pennant since 1946. And the Cardinals, one pitch. One more strike, come on! If you've never heard Mr. Gussie Bush excited, you just heard him over my shoulder. Let's go! Get him out! I pop ball! The Cardinals there! The Cardinals won the pennant! The Cardinals won the pennant! The Cardinals won the pennant! Everybody out! Everybody congratulating everybody! Against what had been overwhelming odds, the Cardinals were pennant winners. We took advantage of everything with three clubs being in first place uh, within the last 10 days. You know what kind of a race uh, it has been, and uh, it's been a hectic thing, but it's all worth it. You can criticize a lot of different people. Sure, you can. Gene, he'll take the criticism as well as anybody, um, and me too. But uh, we were a team, and we got there in first place as a team, and we lost it as a team. And I look at it in that, in that way, that we as a team did not handle going down the stretch the way we should have. Probably the reason I'm still alive is that uh, we didn't win that year because I would have given 15 years off the end of my life if we had to win it. The thing about it that haunts you, you know, is um, any of those games in April, just one of those. If we could have won one in April or any of them, you know, tough to know that you come up one short. The only thing I can say is, good Lord just didn't want us to win it that, th that year. 1964, the year the Phillies did not get into the World Series. The 1967 Red Sox were 100 to 1 long shots to win the pennant. But Dick Williams went into the season with a grandiose plan. The classic line uh, of Dick Williams is here's a guy who has only managed two years, period, in you know, minor leagues, uh, walking in and telling the Boston press that's just seen a, a dismal team play the year before that they're going to win more than they're going to lose. I honestly think we'll win more ball games than we lose. And he guaranteed it. You know, it's like a Joe Namath walking out saying, we're going to beat the Baltimore Colts, you know. And everybody go, ha, 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 right, someday. I thought we had a good enough ball club to play a little better than 500. And maybe I was whistling by a graveyard. I don't know. What no one knew yet was that Carl Yastrzemski was about to transform into a power hitter. Number nine helped him a little bit. Ted Williams had an idea that you can be that kind of hitter and the upward swing and the, the, the hips that Yastrzemski wasn't any of this uh, hitting down at the ball and trying to drive line drives that they did need somebody and he ended up with 44 home runs that year and I can remember 42 of those home runs meant something they either won ball games or tied ball games or brought us back into the ball game Yaz had the type of year that every ball player dreams of as one of 12 players this century to win the triple crown Yaz would chalk up 44 homers, 121 RBIs, and hit 326. He was the toast of a pennant feverish New England. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, the man they call Yaz. When you're in a groove, you just walk up to the baddest box. You don't worry about your feet, your legs, your arms. You're standing there. Come on, throw the ball. Let's go. When number eight is standing at the plate, and then he swings. Yeah, I've never watched a player have a year like that before or since. Uh, it's the best player I have ever watched play the game for one solid year. We love him so in Boston. We all know that when he swings, yeah, here we go again. It seemed like every time we needed a, a two runs, Yaz was coming up. And they pitched to him. That's the, most, the biggest shock. I couldn't understand why people kept pitching to him. We, ke we kept wondering why the, the opposing pitchers kept pitching to him. There was many situations that I said, if I was pitching, I would walk yes. He beat teams time and time again, and it was just like they didn't believe that Kari Ostrimski was hitting all these home runs and knocking in all these runs. In the beginning, before Tony got hit, you know, it was just unbelievable to watch both of them because Tony was the same way. Tony loved to hit in those situations, and he'd always come through. Tony was Tony Canigliero, Boston's hometown hero, who was in the midst of his fourth straight 20 home run season when he was tragically beamed on August 18th. He was an awesome talent. Uh, 
Tony C. would have, he, he would have owned this, this city maybe if he had stayed healthy. And the way it happened, I think it was, it was, it was a, a sick feeling. The effect it had on us, uh, obviously for the immediate thing, we said, well, we, we've probably lost someone here that, that uh, would probably knock us out of winning. It didn't work that way. We, we, uh, we took that more as, a, let's say, something that would spur us on. Uh, you know, we really wanted to win, and it was just a shame he couldn't have been, uh, been there with us. Despite Canigliaro's loss, the Sox went into first place in late August, a near miracle for a team that hadn't been in contention for 18 years. But the Minnesota Twins were a mere half game behind the Red Sox in what was becoming the tightest American League race in decades. In fact, one and a half games separated the top four teams as late as September 28th. While the Twins were breathing down Boston's neck, so were the Chicago White Sox, a pitching-rich team that last went to the World Series in 1959. These Sox didn't have quite the same go-go style as that team, but behind Joe Horland, their pitching carried them. Then, too, there were the Detroit Tigers, whose powerhouse lineup kept them in the thick of the race, a race that back in April, no one expected the young Red Sox to be in. After all, they finished a half game out of last place the year before and were pretty much the same team. As the season went on in 1967, when you would have thought the, the pressure would build, I felt that uh, everything we did was just a plus and that uh, no matter if we fell one game short or ten games short, everybody had been just so excited about the season, uh, we couldn't lose. We were, we were the heroes, and, and that was it. The season came down to the final two games against the Twins. The Red Sox were one game behind, and they had to win both. I know that going into those last few games, that it never entered our mind whatsoever to lose. And I guess you get start believing some of the, the ink that they're writing about you about the impossible dream. Boston's Fenway Park is the setting for the two-day finale of the tightest American League race in history. Vice President Humphrey of Minnesota and Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts are set to cheer the Twins and Red Sox respectively. Boston must win two from Minnesota. In the seventh inning, Carl Yastrzemski blasts a three-run homer to give the Red Sox victory six to four. Yaz ultimately winds up with a triple crown in batting. I would have never won the triple crown in 67 if we weren't involved in the pennant race because we weren't thinking about winning the triple crown. You were going to the plate taking one bat at a time and hitting what the situation called for to help win a ball game. With the Red Sox, Twins, and Tigers in a virtual tie for the pennant, one more Boston victory, coupled with one Detroit loss, would bring the bunting to Beantown and its fans. And so, with one game to decide the pennant, Minnesota's ace, Dean Chance, was going against Boston's ace, Jim Lonborg. It might be a, a little kid's dream to, to be on the mound for the final game of the season, a, a, a game that you have to win uh, to go on to the World Series. Boston started out the game tight. The Twins scored two early runs, but in the sixth, Lonborg surprised everyone. As I walked up to home plate, I took a glance down the third baseline uh, where Cesar Tovar, I think, was playing. And he was playing back quite a bit. I mean, he just figures, here's a pitcher coming up. And I, the thought just occurred to me that I can lay down a bunt and I can beat it out. Good bunt. And he can't play it. A bunt single for Lonborg to lead off the sixth inning. On the next three consecutive pitches, uh, we got base hits. And this is a base hit to center. Swinging away, base hit to left. Lonborg being held at third base, and they're loaded up. Base hit to center. Lonborg scores. Adair will score. It's tied up. The Sox kept up their momentum. They took the lead on Ken Harrelson's bouncer to short. 
and then a wild pitch brought home Yastrzemski with an insurance run. The drama continued into the ninth. The lead was still two runs as all of New England prayed with every pitch. Little soft pop-up. Petroselli will take it. He does. The ball game is over. The Red Sox win it. Within seconds, we were all there together as teammates. And then seconds after that, the people came on the field. For some reason, it seemed like a good thing to do just to stay on the field and enjoy the moment because it really, we had done it. But the more I stayed on the field, the more I realized that I didn't know any of these people that were surrounding me and we were headed towards right field. And then all of a sudden it got scary because they were going to right field and I wanted to go back to the clubhouse. Once in the clubhouse, the Red Sox waited for the outcome of the second game of the Tigers-Angels doubleheader. If the Tigers lost, the pennant would belong to Boston. We were sitting listening to the radio, and it was just as tense listening to that radio as probably playing the game itself uh, against the Twins. Then as the game started to progress and outs were being made and more and more cheers, the crescendo of the whole thing built up. I'll never forget it because Dick McAuliffe, uh, hit into a game-ending double play. His first double play of the season. Game's over, and we're the champions. And then all hell broke loose when McAuliffe hit into that double play. That's the way the season ended for us, and uh, unfortunately, I had to be the one to hit into the double play. And I heard later on that I could hear all the cheers in the uh, Red Sox clubhouse after the game, you know, once I hit into the double play, not that, that they were the champs of the American League. I don't think we realized that we had won the pennant until we actually were in the World Series with the Cardinals. You know, it was like some dream. Uh, and then uh, when the season was over, uh, we knew we accomplished something. A Yankee-Boston game is different probably than any other game the rest of the season. I know that when I'm sitting on the bench like last night and, and sometimes last year and we're playing the Red Sox, uh, I just get full of fury and, and I just want, I want to beat the ball club more than anything in the world, I guess. And I know that my time spent in Boston during the day in the hotel is thinking just primarily about beating the Boston Red Sox. When you come to the park, it's, the park's electric. I mean, the people are really involved in the game, and that brings the players up to another level. It just seemed like it was just a natural built-in hate within one organization of one city hating another organization of another city. For years, that rivalry had built up. It's not the same now because you don't have the same personalities. You don't have Bill Lee calling Billy Martin a Nazi and all that sort of thing. But it just built up and built up, and right up to 78, it really got to be a feeling that this was one of the, the last of the old baseball rivalries, two teams that really do hate each other. God almighty, you can't imagine. It's like the South against the North. In the spring of 1978, the Yankees were preseason favorites to win their third straight pennant. But that didn't discourage the Boston Red Sox, a young team made up almost entirely of homegrown talent. I'm not a guy to predict uh, Eastern Division championships, but I know we're a hell of a ball club and we're going to be tough to beat. Don Zimmer's prediction wasn't as crazy as it sounded. The Red Sox came on strong in May and June. At one point, they won nine straight and were almost unbeatable at home. And in early July, they led the division by seven and a half games. We played well. We had an excellent offense that year. Our pitching was good. And and we felt at the beginning of the season that we were going to have the type of team that could win a division and could win a pennant. Everything seemed to go well in the first part of the season. We played uh, excellent baseball and nobody else was really playing that well and it gave us a, a big lead. What Jim Rice was giving the Red Sox was the season of a lifetime, batting 315, smashing 46 homers, driving in 139 runs, and compiling 406 total bases, the most in four decades. The Yankees, meanwhile, were going nowhere. At one point or another, eight players were sidelined by injuries. In the span of 12 days, they lost four out of six games to the Red Sox, and by mid-July were in third place, 14 games out. To make matters worse, their celebrated feuding resulted in the suspension of their star player, Reggie Jackson, and one week later, July 24th, the resignation of Billy Martin. 
I would like to thank the IT management, the press, the news media, my coaches, my players, and most of all, The Yankees were now in the hands of Bob Lemon, whose easygoing style seemed to rub off on his new team. What had been despair was now hope. Bob came in and, and just kind of like calmed everybody down. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a tough period there for the club at, at one point during the year, and he's a very uh, quiet guy, and, and he just came in and just uh, told us, look, you guys were world champions last year, just start playing like them. And uh, we got the people back healthy, and uh, the team played to the, the, its capabilities. Lemon inherited a team whose one constant all season had been Ron Guidry, and he was never more brilliant than on this night against the Angels. 17 strikeouts for Guidry in the ballgame. Crowd clapping on their feet, yelling... On that June night, Guidry reached the high point in a season that would stand as one of the greatest ever. In winning the Cy Young Award, he would go 25-3 with an ERA of 1.74. I've just been fortunate to uh, you know, be pitching well. I'm, uh, the ball's been going where I wanted to, and uh, it's not like you want to throw a ball inside and you throw it outside. Right now, everything is going my way, and uh, I'm just going to stay at, you know, in that group. Under Lemon, the Yankees started to turn things around. They got healthy again and once more resembled the team that had won the World Series the year before. Even a pair of losses to the Red Sox in early August, one, a 17-inning affair that had to be suspended, did not diminish their spirits. The thing that I think that helped us a lot was the fact that every time we play a different team, they would always tell us that Boston was still looking back at us. They were afraid of us, afraid of us getting hot and catching them. That was a little incentive for us to, uh, to keep going and to keep trying. And if we felt if we got close enough to them to scare them, then we could catch them. In July, the Red Sox certainly looked catchable. They were beset by injuries, and their once comfortable lead was in jeopardy. And though they recovered, their 14-game lead was down to four when the two teams met in Boston for a showdown. Choke is not in my vocabulary. Uh, a slump is. If a guy goes in a slump and you're on a second division ball club, you never hear the word choke. But the minute you're fighting for a pennant and a guy goes into a slump, or a team goes into the slump, the team choked. I, I think that's ridiculous. You can tell when a team's choking. Uh, they look nervous, you know. They just lose their aggressiveness. They become pretty passive. And they don't say much. Uh, but that's not the atmosphere of this club. Maybe not, but the Red Sox completely fell apart against the Yankees. And what became known as the Boston Massacre, the Red Sox endured a four-game thrashing in which they committed 12 errors. When it was over, the Yankees had out-hit the Sox 67-21 and outscored them 42 to 9 and moved into a tie for first place. I'll never forget the, the way the players went about their business before that series. It was kind of spooky because everybody was serious, everybody was, you know, doing their work and it was almost like that feeling, we just knew we were going to win. We didn't do anything right. I mean, the Yankees came in knowing that they had to win. And they, they, they swept us. They, they really kicked our butts pretty good. We just played poor baseball. I mean, we made errors. We, we didn't hit. Uh, we didn't pitch. We didn't do anything right. So that was one of the turning points. If we'd have split right there, we still would have had a comfortable lead. It wasn't exactly a massacre the next weekend in New York. But the Yankees did take two out of three from the Red Sox to move two and a half games in front. But while the tide had definitely turned in New York's favor, the Sox didn't give up. They recovered their poise, and with the season about to exhaust itself, won eight in a row, 12 out of 14. After a while, you didn't feel that they were going to lose a game. Playing the kind of gritty baseball they had to do to get back in it, and also hoping somebody, somewhere along the line, are going to beat the New York Yankees, because the Yankees weren't losing too many. With the season down to the final weekend, the Yankees beat Cleveland in the first two games, 
while Boston was at home beating Toronto. Going into Sunday, the Yankees' margin was still one game, but they lost to the Indians that afternoon, which meant that a Red Sox victory back in Boston would put the two teams in a tie. That last game, every time the run would go up for Cleveland and a zero for the Yankees, the crowd would go crazy. So naturally, we'd turn around and check the scoreboard out ourselves. And we had our game pretty much under control. So uh, it was exciting. There's no question about it. Louis Tiant threw a masterful two-hitter against Toronto. And the regular season ended with the Red Sox and the Yankees tied at 99 wins and 63 losses. It would all be settled the next afternoon at Fenway. Park in Boston, and this is one for the money. All of it. The big bag of marbles. The second playoff game in the history of the American League, and the Boston Red Sox have been involved in them both. Marching back to 1948. And if there's anything else going on in this world today, I don't know what it is, because this is a baseball mad city, and you can imagine it's the same down in New York. The entire city was focused on that one game. Now, there might have been some people who were worried about the stock market or their houses or the insurance bills or something, but say so it just seemed that every person on the street was talking about the Red Sox and the Yankees and what do you think? And, and I think that they anticipated that they were about to, to sit in on history, which they were. The Red Sox pinned their hopes on Mike Torres, while the fate of the Yankees lay in the hands of Ron Guidry. In the bottom of the second, Carl Yastrzemski, the hero of September, hoped to get something started even with the elements working against him. Coming in that day, I said, there's only one way that you can hit a home run. You have to hit it down the right field line and wrap around that foul pole. Uh, anything going out towards the bullpen, the wind is just going to hold up. We have no score in the bottom of the second. That's gone. It's a home run if it stays fair. And a home run for Yastrzemski. The Red Sox lead one to nothing. Oh, he really put a charge into that. It was nice to see him do that, and I kind of had a feeling sitting in the dugout that his Yaz, you know, he's got the big hit, he's got the home run. Maybe this is our day, you know. But playing a lot of baseball games, you realize there's a lot more to go and a lot more is going to happen. Jim Rice added to Boston's lead in the sixth inning when he muscled a pitch from Guidry into center field, putting the Red Sox up two to nothing. One run was all the Sox could get, but they had a two-run lead with three innings to go. Against his former team, Torres was pitching brilliantly. Through six innings, he had a two-hitter. But in the top of the seventh, the Yankees started to stir. Base hit for Chambles as he goes the other way. Base hit for White. Chambles will hold at second base. With two outs and two on, Torres was now facing the ninth hitter in the Yankees lineup, Bucky Dent with four home runs to date. Red Sox fans are terrible pessimists to begin with. And there's a tendency for Red Sox fans to say, who could be the worst guy to beat us and hit the ball out? So there were several people in the press box at the time, and I was thinking about it too. Bucky Dent is the most unlikely person. Fouled off his foot. It's one and one. There was a lot of joking going on when then foul the ball off. It was just like Carbo in, in 75 before he hit his pinch hit home run. My concentration in that game, I had great, great concentration. I was throwing the ball where I wanted and I was throwing hard. And uh, just that one three or four minute time that it took for him to do you know, after he fouled it because he was hobbling and hobbling. I just kind of got out of my rhythm and uh, a little bit of my concentration. Well, I was looking for a certain ball that I could drive because we had two guys on and, and I felt like, you know, that I was going to try and, and hit something hard and, and, and he threw the ball that, that I felt like, um, you know, was my pitch, a ball down and in. Deep to left. Yastrzemski will not get it. It's a home run. A three-run home run for Bucky Dent. The Yankees now lead it by a score of three to two. Bucky Dent has just hit his fifth home run of the year into the screen. And look at that Yankee bench, led by Bob Lemon. And a happy Bucky Dent. 
Watching Don Zimmer almost swallow his chewing tobacco probably, uh, you know, uh, epitomizes what really went on in, in the hearts of the Red Sox. It quieted things down here, but I didn't feel quite that badly because I knew the, the ability of this team to, to score runs. And they did. And they damn near pulled it off, too. The Red Sox got a rally going in the bottom of the eighth. And when the Yankees brought in their ace reliever, Goose Gossage, to hold a 5-3 lead, Boston kept battling. Base hit. Yastrzemski will score. The lead is down to one. It stayed 5-4. And then in the bottom of the ninth, the Sox rallied again. We had one out, and Burleson uh, got on first base. And I remember going to the plate saying to myself, the only thing I don't want to do in this situation is hit into a double play, because I didn't want to end the game. Manila can't see the ball. And they hold the runner at second base. Lou could not see the ball. Forced it for him, right at him. The play forced the Sox to hold Burleson at second in what proved to be a fatal decision, because moments later, Rice's fly ball brought Burleson only as far as third base. Now with two outs and the tying run on third, all hopes rested with Yaz. And then on first and third, two outs, all I was thinking is base it to uh, right field, use the whole ground ball. I was heading to count one and oh, I was said to myself, the way his ball explodes up, that I have to make him bring something down. And on the inside of the pot of plate to try to hit a ground ball for that hole. Uh, I had the pitch exactly what I wanted, uh, I just couldn't get the head of the bat out there. Ball exploded on me. Popped up. That might be it. Nettles over at third base. He'll squeeze it and it's over. Yastrzemski fouls out the Yankee third baseman, Greg Nettles. And look at those Yankees. For Boston, an agonizing end. To walk into the clubhouse and see grown men with tears in their eyes. And uh, I didn't want that because I wanted to tell them how proud I was of that club. It was pride and unbridled joy for the Yankees. If you believe and you play the game and, and you have the character that those guys have, that, that uh, no matter how far behind, you can still do it. Nineteen eighty saw the coming of the Houston Astros, whose rise began in the offseason with the arrival of Nolan Ryan, a deal that made him baseball's first million dollar a year player. The Astros also signed former Cincinnati Red Joe Morgan, who was already a bona fide star at second base. I'd already hit three hundred. I'd already been the most valuable player in the league twice. I'd already won two world championships. The only concern I had was for the team. Houston's biggest concern coming into the 1980 season was the Los Angeles Dodgers. Unlike the newly competitive Astros, the Dodgers had a long history of winning. And even though they were coming off a third place finish, they were no less confident than usual. We have the best team right now on paper in the National League Western Division. If everyone stays healthy and we do the job that we're capable of doing, there's no question in my mind or no doubt in my mind that we're going to win the whole thing. Lopes' prediction held up through the first half of the season when the Dodgers went into the All-Star break in a virtual tie for first place. Their great pitching was exemplified by Jerry Royce's gem against the Giants on June 27th at Candlestick Park. Little number back to Royce. He picks it up. He's got a no hitter. With the team's fortunes riding high in the first half, the Dodgers boasted a prominent contingent at the All-Star Game in Dodger Stadium. Four players in the starting lineup. The Astros, meanwhile, had their ace on the mound. Pitching from the Houston Astros, the first right-hander in league history to strike out 300 batters in one season. J.R. Richard. Richard. J.R. Richard was a big reason the Astros went into the All-Star break tied for first place. And it didn't take any time for American League hitters to find out how dominating he was. But what no one knew then was that Richard would suddenly and mysteriously lose it all. 
on July 14th, just days after the All-Star game, while throwing on an off day, Richard had a stroke that threatened his life and all but ended his career. All of a sudden I felt a lot ringing in my ear, a real loud high-pitched tone ringing in my ear. Then I felt nauseated. Then I just laid down on AstroTurf. I remember the guys talking, picking me up, putting me in the ambulance. I remember talking to the guys. On the way to the hospital, I guess I just went out. Richard was hospitalized that day and again at the end of July. By then, it was clear he wouldn't be able to pitch the rest of the season. And it looked as though Houston's pennant hopes were dashed. When we lost JR this year, it would have been very easy for our club to lay down and just die at that point into a folder. But we didn't. We continued to fight. We continued to battle. We wanted to show that we have a good ball club. Despite losing one of the game's most intimidating pitchers, the Astros stayed in the race. They played neck and neck with the Dodgers in September, finally overtaking L.A. at the end of the month. The race came to a head on October 3rd. Houston, three games up with three to play, took on the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. Tommy Lasorda's team may not have had the odds on its side, but the Dodgers did have some 50,000 fans pulling for them. The first night I stood on the steps and you could see the fans were, it was a Friday night and they, they had been built up to the point that if we win three, we have a one game playoff and they, they were noisy and I kind of stood on the steps and took a towel and kind of waved it, see if I got a response and they started cheering and we had a couple guys injured. So we needed what turned out to be the 10th man. Come the 10th inning of the series opener, the Astros needed one more out. The score was all even at two, and up at the plate, Joe Ferguson. Here's Force for the windup and the pitch to Joe. Long fly ball, a way back to Daniel at the warning track. Up in the air, can't get it. Home run, Dodgers win. And the Dodgers win a dramatic come from behind victory over the Astros, who will have to wait another day, three to two. The next day, Steve Garvey gave the Dodgers a 2-1 lead when he bashed a fourth-inning home run off Nolan Ryan. It was all the Dodgers needed as they beat Houston for the second straight day. And so the division title came down to the final game of the regular season, a must-win for the Dodgers. The game was excruciatingly tense, a pitcher's duel all the way to the eighth when the Dodgers put the tying run on first and Ron Say at the plate. Garvey ready to go. Say waiting at the plate. Here's the pitch. Fly ball to deep left field. Left center. Scoring line. This ball is gone! When we first went in there, we thought we had it. You know, three games left, and uh, we three games ahead. Um, but uh, to our surprise, you know, they come back and beat us to this straight game. And uh, this just show you, you should relax, no matter how many games you are ahead. With the sweep by L.A., the two teams would go at it one last time. The one-game playoff would be played at Dodger Stadium amidst a sea of Dodger blue. But that didn't discourage the Astros or Art Howe. His three-run homer in the third inning sprang open Houston's offense. The Astros scored seven runs against a slew of Dodger pitchers and finally put a stop to L.A. Tommy Lasorda's Dodgers tried every which way to come back, but there was nothing doing against 20-game winner Joe Necro. We had put so much into the three games, I think we came out a little flat on Monday, even though it was a one-game playoff and we're geared up for the fastball and had to face Joe Necro, and he had the knuckleball fluttering that day, and I think they got on us early and took out the 10th man, so to speak. But it was the greatest four-game series I ever played in. Here's the stretch and the pitch. Swung on a bouncing ball to Bergman at first. He steps on the bag, and the Astros are the National League Western Division champions. Division winners for the first time in the Astros' 19-year history. just a great pennant race. I mean, it was great for baseball, great for fans, and, 
and just great for the game itself. Um, it, it's by far the best I've been in. It was just a great, great battle, to, to tell you the truth, between us and the Braves, and it was it, it was fun. I mean, I like that kind of stuff. Every day, man, the pressure was there to go out and perform, I and mean, you didn't have time to relax and, and think about everything because every day was a big game. You're stressed out a little bit. You're, you're mentally tired. Every day is do or die. You're constantly, like you say, looking at the newspaper, looking at the standings, uh, looking at pitching matchups, see who's going to win, you know, who, who they got going tonight. Do they have a chance of winning or, or that type of thing? We were totally exhausted at the end of the season ourselves because most of us slept for two weeks. It was fun. It was draining emotionally. And uh, it was just a... Uh, uh, a script, you know, it's just if you can write it out, that's the way you would want something like that to come down to with two great teams. At a Louisville hotel in December of 1992, the Giants truly became Giants with one fell swoop of a pen when they signed one of the game's premier talents. I'm very pleased to announce today that the San Francisco Giants have signed a contract with Barry Bonds, a six year agreement. The agreement will make Barry the best paid player in the game. It's a lot of money, but there's only one Barry Bonds. You pretty happy to have something agreed upon here? Yeah, very happy. Glad it's all over. While Barry Bonds and the Giants celebrated their future, the Braves made a big move only a day later. An organization like ours, which for years has demonstrated its appreciation of great pitching, made an extraordinary effort signing right-handed pitcher Greg Maddox. I think it proves the significance of those kind of uh, free agent signings. And if you have already a good team in place and a good foundation, uh, one signing like that of uh, Barry Bonds or Greg Maddox can, can really put you over the hump. And it helped to create one of the most exciting pennant races in the history of baseball. Bonds uh, helping to lead the Giants and, of course, Maddox being the leader on our pitching staff. On opening day, Greg Maddox led the Braves against his former club, the Chicago Cubs, at Wrigley Field with a 1-0 shutout. As if not to be outdone by Maddox, the Giants' Barry Bonds had a memorable debut in San Francisco's home opener. With the expectations riding high, Bonds connected in his first at-bat. That one's high, deep right field. This has a chance. First at bat before the new hometown fans. A spectacular April and May by the Giants let the Braves know that the National League West race would be anything but a cakewalk. When the teams clashed in mid-April, the Giants took three of four at Candlestick. San Francisco's hot start catapulted the Giants into first place with a four and a half game lead by the end of May. We wanted to get off to a good start by preparing these guys in spring training because we knew that with the balanced schedule, if you get off to a, uh, a poor start, it's going to be hard to catch who, whoever's in front of you because, because you're not playing them as many times as you used to. In the past, you'd play your team in the division 18 times so you could catch up yourself. That was our objective. Another reason for that fast beginning was the 7-0 start of John Burkett. It was the best record for a Giants pitcher at the start of a season since Juan Marichal was 10-0 in 1966. San Francisco's success left Braves fans in a quandary. Atlanta had gotten off to an outstanding start, yet found itself nine games back by the All-Star break. A frustrating scenario at best. As far as the Braves are concerned, everybody kept saying, what's wrong with the Braves? Why are they not winning? Instead of saying, hey, the Giants are playing great ball and giving them some credit. A lot of people thought that we were just going to go out from start to finish and it was going to be a cakewalk and there was going to be no challenge for us. And uh, I don't think anybody on our team uh, as ball players, thought that it was going to be easy. We all knew it was going to be a struggle and we knew there was going to be some teams that had something to say about us winning another division. You know, they jumped out to the big lead and we thought, you know, let's just play well and eventually they'll hit their skid and they never did. We were winning every series we played and we were still losing losing ground in the standings. The Braves front office made a big move with the acquisition of one of the league's most feared hitters, Fred McGriff. A welcome addition and a tremendous coup for the Braves who would benefit immeasurably from Fred's presence. It's like the rich got richer. You know, they got a good situation over there with managers, they make good decisions and uh, it seems like they can just foresee you know, what a move is going to mean down the line. 
he's a guy that when you're sitting in that other dugout, you don't like to see come up. I mean, you have a lot of respect for him. And anytime you add somebody that's that much of an impact hitter, it's going to rub off on the other guys. And it did. Everybody caught fire. Atlanta's burning could almost be said literally. Fred's first game in a Braves uniform was delayed by a press box fire. But later that night, Fred Dog fired it up with his bat. To center field, Andy. It's out of here. We're tied. Welcome to Atlanta, Fred Woodruff. This is exactly why the Atlanta Braves went out and acquired Fred McGriff. After sparking a come-from-behind victory against St. Louis, the next night, McGriff continued pumping fuel to the fire. Goes deep this time. He sends Gilkey back to the wall. He can't get it. Home run, Fred McGriff. Three home runs in less than 24 hours. Take a look at the next governor of Georgia, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I think the biggest thing for us all is that we had another guy in there we knew that we didn't have to try to burden it all ourselves. We could relax and let him take a little bit in there. As a whole, it worked out for all of us. Despite big production from Atlanta's newly fired up lineup and a nine game winning streak, the Braves could only cut San Francisco's lead to seven and a half games as the Giants continued to roll. He hammers this one way back, way back, gone, and the Giants just got a good illustration of why they are having a sensational season. The day after that bottom of the ninth inning two out blast, the Giants and Braves would finally go head to head on August 23rd on what was billed as the series of the season. This is what baseball is about, you know, first and second place clashing and uh, pennant race on the line. And so for a baseball player, this situation you want to be in, this is a situation that you dream about when you were playing in the backyard. And uh, you go out on the field tonight and for these next three games and let it all hang out. The Braves threw their three aces. Steve Avery looked to pull the Braves to six and a half out in game one by beating the Giants for the third time in 93. In game two, it was Tom Glavin. And in the finale, Greg Maddox. All three came up aces. Here's the one, two. Struck him out, and the Braves have gained a game on the Giants as they win the first of a three-game set. Interesting to see that Glavin's first two pitches to him have been fastballs. Got him with a curveball. Line, and he caught it. Boy, <laughs> he must feel like he's at Okinawa out there. Meanwhile, it was the Giants pitchers who were bombed by Braves bats. High in the air, deep to left center field. Bonds going back. Long home run for Fred McGriff. And he drives one deep to right field. This one's going to be out of here. Three nothing Atlanta. Deep to right center field. It ain't going to hold that one. He's got two. Braves got a five to nothing lead. Back-to-back -back solo shots. Justice and McGriff have done it again. Atlanta completed a three-game sweep to pull to four and a half out. At the time, a uh, two, three, four-game lead, it was almost like we were in second place at the time, even around the Bay Area or uh, any of the media that we faced. It was like, it was almost, even though we were in front still, it was like we were behind. The momentum had clearly shifted in favor of the Braves. And a week later, they once again beat the Giants to the punch, taking two of three from San Francisco. Eventually, they took sole possession of first place, sending Atlanta into a frenzy. Driven along the line and left, back toward the wall. It is a home run. It's a home run. Yeah, just homered off the top of the wall. The Braves win a five-run bottom of the night, and Atlanta. Now we're chasing the Braves, and everybody, I think, pretty much counted us out at that time. They thought the Braves were going to run, run away from it from there. But, uh, you know, I think that just showed the character of our ball club to stick in there and, um, you know, keep chasing the Braves. The Giants roared back, winning 11 of 12. And when the Braves lost 2 of 3 to Houston, their lead shrank to half a game with one series left for each team. The entire season came down to the final weekend. Here we were all thinking, geez, you know, the Rockies hadn't beaten 
the Braves all season long. We said, well, we've got to win one game. We knew the Dodgers had a little payback from the from the previous year, and we knew that we knew the Dodgers probably wanted to win a lot more than the Rockies wanted to win. Yet another Giants Dodgers season boils down to a head-to-head -head matchup. Sounds like another chapter in that great Giant Dodger tradition. Fly ball short right. McGee breaks in, and we are tied with three games to play. High and deep to center field. Back to the wall goes Jones. It is gone. Three-run homer. The Braves lead the National League West by a half game. The score will almost certainly be flashed on the scoreboard in Dodger Stadium in the next 30 seconds. performance by Barry Bonds and the Giants come back from four down to win and we are tied with two to play two games to decide a division flag Greg Maddox on the next to last day of the regular season defeated the Rockies for his 20th victory the Braves cruise to a 10 to 1 win meanwhile in Los Angeles Reliever Rod Beck hoped to close out a much more competitive game between the Giants and Dodgers. The Giants led 5-3 in the bottom of the ninth. Hit on the ground to Benjamin. And the season goes to the final day. 103 apiece and counting. The Braves needed to complete a three-game sweep of the Rockies and hope for a Giants loss in their final game of the season against the Dodgers. Atlanta was gunning for its third division flag in three years. Tom Glavin, a 20-game winner for the third straight season, showed the Rockies little mercy. The 0-2 pitch on the way, strike three, swinging a very strong start for Tom Glavin. Also coming up big for the Braves, David Justice. Curve swung, high drive right field. Clark is back. He looks up in the corner. It is the home run, Justice. Justice's 40th homer of the season launched the Braves to a 5-3 win. The Atlanta Braves have run the table against the Colorado Rockies. 13-0 against them, and now scoreboard watching will be the order of the day. The Giants needed a win to force a one-game playoff, and 21-year-old Solomon Torres was given the ball and simple advice. I mean, my thoughts are, you know, like Al Davis said, just win, baby. Braves fans watch from Fulton County Stadium as the pennant picture unfolded and Mike Piazza captured the moment. Piazza, my hero, came through. Right-handed delivers. There's a high drive in the right field. Martinez to the track, to the wall, gone. He hits a high fly ball to right field. Back goes Martinez to the wall. It is gone. Miracle upon miracles, he's hit another one, and it's 10-1 to Dodgers. The Dodgers had avenged their late-season playoff-shattering loss to the Giants in 91. With 103 victories, San Francisco finished second-best to the Atlanta Braves 104 in one of the greatest pennant races ever. Tip of the hat to the whole San Francisco organization. I love the city of San Francisco. I can't wait to go there, but we ain't going today. And that's the best news. The Braves had stood the test of a grueling division race, but then lost the championship series in six games to the Philadelphia Phillies. To be sure, the postseason is another test altogether. For some, it's the sad end to a thrilling journey. For others, it's a dream come true. Uh, 
the New York baseball writers have their annual dinner, you know, the following January, the, you know, like the last week in January, last Sunday in January. Bobby and I were in the show. I sang the song. I lost the game, but wound up with the dame, which I got married 17 days later. And uh, it, I sang Because of You, a parody to Because of You, and it went, Because of You, I should never been born. Because of You, Dodger fans are forlorn. I still remember the words now, 40 years later. Because of you, they yell, drop dead, and several million want my head to sever forever in scorn. One lonely bird had a word for my ear. The only girl, what a pearl of good cheer. I lost the game, but wound up with the dame. She took my name in spite of you. My fame is sure, thanks to your Sunday pitch. Uh, up high or low, I don't know which is which, but come next spring, keep throwing me that thing and I will swing because of you. <laughs> so hey, we got on the uh, we got on the Ed Sullivan show with that.